going to guide our discussion on cultural appropriation in food and farming. Um, I'd like to start um, before we dive into our discussion to just acknowledge um, that for those of us sitting here in Ithaca or who are um, in this region, that we're here on land that was stolen from the Haudenosaunee people, um, the people of the Cayuga Nation who were given the name Iroquois. Um, as farmers and producers, land stewards, as um, somebody who eats, we are part of a food system um, and recognize that issues and challenges of theft, discrimination, and unequal, um, unequal access to resources for indigenous people of color, refugees, and other underrepresented individuals and cultures is not just a thing of the past, um, but is also a reality every day um, for so many. So Groundswell is a food justice and beginning farmer training organization, and we are based in the Finger Lakes. And as we train the next generation of farmers envision a sustainable and viable food system, we believe that equity has to be at the center of this work. So we began the Farming for Justice discussion group to discuss topics that are at the intersection of farming and justice. Um, we acknowledge that farming and beginning farming is a predominantly white um, sector. It's white led and white dominated. And so without centering the issues that maintain this discrimination um, and unfair access, we can't change this paradigm. So Farming for Justice, if you're new to it, is a place where we can ask questions, challenge each other to rethink our food system. Um, because anti-racism work and an equitable, sustainable food system is based on relationships, we like to hold these justice um, discussion groups locally. So that's why there's not, it's not just that this whole thing is online, because um, it's important for us to build relationships with folks who are interested in this work. Um, so we encourage you to invite people to wherever you are for the next discussion or any of the future discussions and start your own local network of farming for justice. Um, Couple of logistics for today um, and for Farming for Justice discussion groups. When there's discussions, small, small group discussions here in the, in the office where we are, the folks on Zoom, you'll be put into small group discussions as well electronically so you can have discussions amongst yourselves and then we'll bring you back to the whole group for the continued facilitator discussion. Unfortunately, from our experience, it's pretty hard to hear folks on Zoom. So when you have questions, please type them in the chat box and then we'll repeat them. I'll repeat them so that everybody can hear them, including the facilitator and the folks in this room. So you won't be able to speak and do make sure you're on mute. That's helpful as well. Um, and after the session, everybody who's here, plus everybody online, will get an email with a really short evaluation form, feedback form. Um, those are really helpful, so I hope you just take a minute or two to fill it out. They allow us to continue to offer these for free to compensate our facilitators and to make these relevant and important. So I think that's all. I'm going to hand it over to Patrice um, to introduce herself. And then we'll dive right in. Thanks for being here. Good morning, everyone. I'm really delighted to see folks here and diving into a topic like this, uh, a topic that is certainly uh, essential in the food world, in the world of justice. And as we move forward in a society uh, that, well, let's just tell the truth, uh, isn't here for everyone. Uh, so, uh, this is an effort to see what we can add uh, to that narrative and how we might be able to change it. Um, a couple of things about uh, what you may have um, read or seen or heard about me. Uh, Patrice Lockwood Anthony, uh, Patrice, you can just refer to me as Patrice. That's for you guys at the table. <laughs> um, I am, I have recently been referred to as a thought leader, uh, which I love by the way, uh, but I have begun calling myself um, a cultural provocateur. And the reason I do that, uh, you know, back when, and yes, I'm old enough for, for this to be so, uh, the internet was just getting started. <laughs> uh, my handle, we called it that back then, <laughs> was Gadfly. And I have done that kind of thing my entire uh, life. And lately, uh, when I say things that 
uh, are meant to get people to think and discuss and speak. Uh, I get accused of having too strong a personality or pushing things to the edge or over the edge or being too hard on people. So I want to start this by saying uh, this. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what I do. That's what I love to do. And that's quite frankly what we all need to do. So I ask generative questions. I provoke conversation and I provoke uh, core responses in people because we need to start thinking about how we live our lives and there are too many of us that just sort of live robotically accepting um, what society has told us we are and that includes uh, everything from white privilege uh, to people of color feeling defeated and tired and exhausted um, and speaking of exhausted uh, I returned uh, on the fourth from a three-day intensive course uh, on collaborative executive management uh, in Massachusetts. Um, I'm the president of Green Star Cooperative Market. And then on the sixth, I was a poll site manager, Democratic poll site manager for our uh, Tuesday election. So I was there from five in the morning until 10 o'clock last night. And I hadn't finished my notes for this, so I haven't been to bed yet. <laughs> it's good to meet y'all. <laughs> um, but this was too important for me to not finish those notes. So here we are doing this work. I welcome you to it. Uh, I cheer you on, and I hope that somewhere in all of this, uh, we all manage to be uh, even just a little bit inspired. Uh, so what I'm going to do this month and next month, this month we're going to uh, ask generative questions. We're going to have a little bit of discussion uh, in, in terms of asking and answering questions, uh, maybe share a little bit. Uh, I've come up with seven sequences based on the first article. The second two articles are actually for next month, and we're going to break into discussion groups because I want us uh, to, one, commit to continuing the work. We always do this uh, hit and run uh, training and workshops where you know you sign up for one, you do the work, and you think suddenly you've been schooled, uh, that you know what's up, and that's just so very wrong. Um, it took 400 years for America to be what it is. Uh, you're not going to unlearn privilege or uh, revisit defeat and make it victory uh, in a training. So buckle up, <laughs> okay? Um, and Elizabeth? Yeah. Um, so uh, we're gonna just do short introductions this morning. Um, the folks who are on Zoom, if you could type your name in the chat box, any affiliation with a farm organization that you might have, and something that is inspiring you today about the, the work that we're, we're here together um, to do in the food system. And while you're all doing that on Zoom, we'll go around really quickly with the, the folks in the room and say, say the same thing. So we'll all meet back up in just a minute or two. So um, I'll start. Um, so I'm Elizabeth. Recognition of, of the long enduring work that's uh, ahead of us and, and behind many people as well. So we
here with Grouse Golf Center, the local food and farming. And um, I am inspired by you this morning that Florida passed a um, initiative to initiate um, to um, get former former felons their voting rights back. And so 1.4 million people or something like that are now able to participate in Florida. And I'm inspired that that success will really catch on um, in this country. And um, yeah, it was, it was fantastic news. So the voting whole thing, that particular initiative is very inspiring this morning. I'm Laura and I'm affiliated with the youth farm and on the board of Groundswell and on the accountability committee at Groundswell. And um, I am inspired by the potential and power of youth, especially youth that are rising into voting ages in the next two years, which is going to be my personal focus in this area. I'm officially saying that. Um, so I'm really excited about that. Obviously, at the youth farm, we work with youth, and we've been working with the high schools, so we're totally got ins to the high schools, and yeah, I'm just, I'm just going to be focusing on that for the next couple of years, so, um, yes, that's all. Hey, I'm Natalie. I'm also with Groundswell Center for Local Food and Farming, and I'm on the coordinating team of Tompkins County's Showing Up for Racial Justice chapter. Um, I'm really inspired. I haven't fully synthesized the news, but um, at some of the smaller governor races that were won, um, and that weren't won by money, but were won by grassroots organizers and people coming together. Um, and that's really inspiring to me. Great. So. Therese will share her inspiration and take it back over. Hopefully everyone can hear us again. We had muted it for a second for intros, but realized that wasn't communicated well. So we should be able to hear us all. Thanks for sharing some of your information on the chat too. I am really, really excited at some of the, <laughs> um, some of what I'm reading in the chat boxes. So, Yay, you guys. <laughs> um, really excited about what I've heard here as well. Now, I know a few of the people here. Um, uh, I, um, there's too much to list. So um, let's see. Uh, I already told you I'm president of Green Stars Board of Directors. Uh, we're in the midst of an expansion that is making me tired. Uh, lots of great work going on there, but it is exhausting because we're trying to uh, create several cultural shifts uh, there. Um, it is a progressive, liberal organization that has been around for 45 plus years, but it is also a progressive, liberal organization that just elected three years ago its first African American uh, female leader. So, hmm, <laughs> uh, something else to think about. <laughs> so I also, I'm a writer. Uh, I own my own business, uh, uh, a writer's alchemy uh, that does training and workshops, um, mostly for juniors and seniors in high school, uh, getting them ready for their after high school experiences. Um, and I am also <laughs> a, uh, I just started my second business that is called On Leadership, and I am a diversity and inclusion uh, trainer, uh, consultant, um, mostly in the co-op world, although let's face it, we're needed everywhere. <laughs> Lots of work to be done in that area. Um, what inspires me? Having people realize the intersectionality between their gut, their core, uh, their intellect, their spirit, and their heart, uh, specifically when doing 
this work because if we don't advance on the side of truth um, and the realities of the lack of justice and what it takes for us all to come together to create real justice, um, I feel we're lost. Uh, but I think there are enough of us who are finally waking up and wanting to come to this work uh, that there is certainly hope, but I want there to be more than hope. Uh, I want there to be progress. Mm -hmm. And that only happens when we actually do the work and commit to it long term. Uh, so there goes that idea again. Um, uh, there is a lot of work. So let's jump in uh, on that first article. How many read it? Write in the chat box if you did the first article. I said it wasn't required. <laughs> some answers. So Technically, it's not required. <laughs> but if you want to keep up with me, <laughs> you should at least glance at the articles <laughs> and get a sense of it because the, the questions, the generative questions that I'm going to be pulling and, and asking will be pulled from the articles. So it doesn't have to be, um, you, when you were in school, whether it was high school or college or whatever, and you'd get the reading assignments, and there were some students that would sit and very, like, read over every single word and highlight and scribble in the margins, and yeah, no. <laughs> Be the student that glanced over the articles and caught the points where it's emboldened, where it reminds you of what the instructor was saying to you, that sort of a thing, things that catch your attention. Read over that and comment on that in your, in your margins and in pencil. We must never write in books and magazines. I'm a library nerd. <laughs> okay, so here I'm gonna give you the seven uh, major areas here. Um, so let me start with saying that uh, I do believe in that intersectionality I mentioned. So everything I say and, and do is coming from a place of love. I'm saying that ahead of time because sometimes you will not feel it from what I am saying. But that is where it is coming from because we can't move forward unless we do some pretty tough things and hear some tough messages, okay? Uh, so the first area is going to be around, and these are all taken from the article. Well, most of them are. Um, uh, Poshman, in an article called Is This Food Racist, interviewed Rosie Perez, interviewed a couple of other people, but I'm going to be specifically talking about an interchange between uh, Poshman and Perez. Um, and then uh, our concerns as people of color innocuous. Uh, because someone referred to them that way. Uh, and the question behind that is, what's behind our concerns as people of color? Uh, three, privilege and cultural exploitation, and particularly, I want to talk about this term that has arisen called culinary colonialism. Mm. It's deep, isn't it? Um, and four, is it okay to cook other people's food? because uh, there are some interesting questions in and around that that we need to uh, both as um, uh, white people and people of color need to think about. Um, and then uh, what's at stake for people of color on this issue? What's at stake for white privilege? Six, what are some possible solutions which might move us toward greater equality and justice in the food arena? And finally, seven, under what circumstances is it okay for other, in quotes, to prepare our food, our being people of color? Um, and I'm coming at this from two places. So it's important for people of color and for white people uh, to really think about this. Uh, I had an interesting conversation uh, with an African-American young man who has decided that what we need to do is just burn the whole 
Burn the whole fucking house down. <laughs> this is what he wanted to do. This is what he feels is necessary. Um, and believe me, I have felt this way before myself. But the question that doesn't often get asked is, are you standing in that house? Mm. Because if you want to burn the house down and you're in the house, what have you accomplished? So the place I'm coming from as a cultural provocateur, as a thought leader, as an intellectual, as a person who is doing this work on a daily and has been for well over 30 years is this. This is not just a people of color struggle. It's not just a white struggle and everybody has responsibility and accountability in the whole thing, right? Because part of what we've been talking about a lot is how um, black people shouldn't have to teach white people. Uh, white people should know about their privilege. And uh, at the same time, uh, what are people of color responsible for and all of this. And it's gotten so mucked up and tangled up. Uh, what's, real, what's real here? What do we need in order to move forward? And in this context, we're talking about farming and food justice, right? Which is the basic, because we all come together around food and none of that food happens without the farming, right? Although there are children who think it does. <laughs> okay, so those are the seven areas and we're actually gonna talk about those things across today and next month. Okay, so those are the seven large areas that I hope even after next month, people will spend time uh, thinking about and questioning because it's time that we stop the blame game and everybody get on board to try to fix this shit. Because we're losing, we're losing the war because we're so busy dividing ourselves and who's responsible for what. Uh, we all need to do the work. Is that, a, you think that's a fair assessment? Yeah. Okay, that's for those of you in there too, and on Zoom too, is that a fair assessment? I wanna hear what you have to say about this. The second thing that you said is- A question to, for Patrice was to repeat the second thing that she said. The second thing on the list. As are our concerns as people of color innocuous? Oh, and, then the and what is behind those concerns? In other words, there's always a motivating factor, right? So if there are people who believe that the concerns that people of color have around this issue are innocuous, um, is there anyone who needs to know what innocuous is? Okay. Um, well, What's the, I want it kind of to me. That, that, that it doesn't matter. That we're blowing it off out of proportion. Okay. That would be annoying. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Okay. So are people of color blowing this issue up out of proportion? Uh, is it really not as important? Are we just having delicate feelings? Are we being too sensitive? Okay. But here's the question that lies underneath that. And I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but it's necessary. What's the motivating factor behind asking people of color if they're just being too sensitive? Uh, there's a motivating factor behind that. Just like there's a motivating factor behind I want to burn the whole fucking house down. Something, there's always a why. You know how mommies are with their four-year-olds who get into that why phase? <laughs> and every time you give an answer, they just have another why? It's because that's very real. There's always another why. It's Socratic. There's always another why. And there are always motivating factors for what we say, what we do, what we think, what we feel. So if someone is asking, are people of color just being too sensitive over this? Before you answer that, you have to ask yourself, why the question is being asked in the first place. 
where they are coming from when they ask that question. Okay? And um, six, uh, what are some possible solutions which might move us toward greater equality and justice in the food arena? Seven, uh, under what circumstances is it okay for other to prepare our food? Motivation around this one, my motivation around number seven is, do you see where we could go a little too far with this in terms of the sort of blame game and wanting to hold on to what's ours? If we go to a certain place, wouldn't we at some point start deciding who can farm what? Mm. Who can grow what? <laughs> who can sell what? Who can eat what? <laughs> Is that the world we want? So provocative thinking around that. Uh, and I think we need to do some of that and then spread what we come to, right? Uh, so, uh, does anybody online have any questions at this point? <laughs> wow. Thank you for starting. <laughs> okay. In that case, I'm going to give it to someone here. Um, I'm going to throw a question out there based on the is this food is this food racist? Uh, when Poshman was interviewing Rosie Perez, Rosie Perez was talking about uh, how sick she gets of people even now asking her if she still eats beans and rice. And that she considers that to be racist. And Poshman, who is Jewish, responded with, he didn't understand that because as a Jewish man, he would not have considered someone asking him about the filter fish to be racist in origin. And Rosie's response was, well, maybe that's because you're not a person of color. And I was telling Elizabeth today that my immediate response when I read that was, well, people don't associate the filter fish with poverty. It's associated with culture. In the Jewish culture, it doesn't matter what your economic uh, level is. You might be eating gefilte fish. Beans and rice, on the other hand, tends to be associated with poverty. It's a quick, easy, inexpensive meal to prepare. And I can't think, unless they were thinking of her as a chef, <laughs> why someone would keep asking Rosie Perez if she still eats beans and rice. Now, I still eat it, but there are, I know there are 50 million different ways to prepare beans and rice. And I love beans and rice, right? But from a cultural perspective and how outside looks in, how gefilte fish is viewed, and how beans and rice viewed are entirely different. But he didn't have a lens for that. And that's what happens with privilege. So where's the block for the two of them? I mean, how could they have this discussion uh, without um, without culture and uh, this notion of race getting in the way of it. Uh, how do you talk about the filter fish and rice and beans such that we can have a conversation about how we get our food, how we raise our food, how we eat our food, when we eat our food, 
you know, and on both sides. Because for us, when someone asks me about watermelon, and they do it fairly frequently still, <laughs> you know, yes, I'm looking at you like, now what if I don't like watermelon? Now you wouldn't have a way of knowing that, right? But why would you assume that my favorite food was watermelon? Why are you asking me about chitlins, which I don't eat? <laughs> you know, why are you asking me this? And these are the things I want us to start thinking about when we're sitting down, when we're having these conversations, when we feel ourselves having that awkward moment what's happening to you inside that's creating the awkward moment and what was motivating the person who asked uh the question that my usual response tends to be well see that was just stupid mm. but there's more to it than that it was just stupid right just lack of respect yeah. and sometimes lack of knowledge because privilege protects you you don't have to know some things. But it's an injury because you can come in knowing just something very surfacy, mm -hmm. but that has implications. Like yeah. That. What what is the end? I just want to repeat it. It's an it's an end to like maybe a place where you're not comfortable. Maybe you're not comfortable uh, talking to people of color because you maybe you don't know any people of color, so you're gonna pick some kind of surface kind of issue that really is not a surface issue really because mm -hmm. a lot of times you're coming with so much lack of knowledge like you said and and it's not a respectful place it's just kind of like instead of just why don't you just go with what you know about people why do you have to pick the one thing that maybe became prominent in your lack of knowledge of another culture as a way to connect with another person well boom it doesn't work you're not yeah. going to connect with me by like picking chitlins or rice and beans to try and make me open up or be your friend or get to know me. That's not the right appropriate way. I mean, so, that's true. So, so wh where do we go from there? Because, right, remember I said that about being awkward. So, what do we do? I, I, I don't know if I have that answer, but okay. maybe from what I have to say, that answer will come. Okay. First of all, I think that you can ask about a million and three things. It doesn't have to be food. So that's, I, I, the fact that like, oh, maybe that's an end, I don't think that we need to look at it that way because you can ask, did you like the, this movie? Did you, you know, like that's not, we, that's not a real thing. I don't think that that can be an end. Why, why would you have to approach it that way? Why would you ask about someone's traditional food? That can be something private. We, we don't know. Why would you go up to someone and just, and just approach like that? Would we do that under other circumstances? Would we do that to other people? And, and, and I think with the situation with um, Perez and Posh, is it? Poshman. Poshman. Um, I have a question of, well, how many times does he get asked? things like that as opposed to she's clearly being asked this right. multiple times right and like so that right there kind of tells us a little bit about the motivation of why she's being asked this question which again why would you even ask that why is that a thing that someone is thinking about what is the motivation behind that and i think that the motivation behind that isn't an in i think the motivation behind that is an ask is sometimes seen as a, a, it, people feel like they can objectify that. Ooh, let me poke around. Can I touch your hair? Do you still eat rice and beans? Do you eat watermelon? Like, those are things that are not like, that's, I just don't, I, I don't think that, I think that the lack of respect comes from the discrimination and racism based in how we think of people and and who those people are and why we think of them that way and why we think of them that way okay there's a comment from um someone on the chat saying the food is often why we like the very reason we come together so i've asked if she has a question with that but my sense is like 
foods much more in our face um, present when we're interacting with each other than the other examples that you said. So maybe that's, so, that I'm, I'm not sure if that's her exact thought, but she, she made that comment. I mean, I, it's, wanted, it's, I wanted to say one more thing um, too about that, because I, I'm not necessarily saying that in its essence, it's an in or that it should be, but on the surface, it appears right. to, to achieve that. That seems what like an I, easy what, way to start a yeah, conversation. What I think really is that if I analyze the motivation of someone that would start with that place, is I can tell that they're uncomfortable with me. I can tell that they don't know what to do with me. It's kind of like, oh, what do I do with this thing? So, it, you know, in the surface of it, I think that people use whatever to kind of normalize things and never speak about really what they feel and like. Mm -hmm. or, what's going on or what they're doing objectifying or whatever it is so yeah I mean, that's all. so um let's take it back to white privilege for for a moment uh because a lot of this conversation is generated out of that right this notion of of white privilege and appropriation of cultural foods and um and of course an awkward place so we're not comfortable with you and for whatever reason they think this is the way <laughs> to generate maybe conversation. To, yeah, maybe try and stomp you down right from the get-go because- So maybe, but from the, from the position of white privilege, uh, we know, uh, at the very least suspect, we know that there is a different lens being used. Mm -hmm different lens entirely and privilege protects the privileged right there are questions that don't have to get asked um yeah it, it's it protects a certain level of ignorance um and that's not ignorance not in the sense of intelligence ignorance we, you just don't know some things because you don't have to people of color are in a different place uh in order to move ahead to progress, uh, to understand how the systems work so that we can advance. We often have to be multilingual, multicultural in our understanding of how things work. White privilege means you do not need to do any of that because your power and your authority and your influence and your welcome mat is extended through the color of your skin uh, by birthright. So you don't have to take the time to know what makes someone comfortable or uncomfortable. You can just ask the question. And there's not gonna be you know, any blowback on you because you exist in this place. Uh, a white chef that starts cooking soul food, right, uh, doesn't have to think about the blowback because they're white and can do that. And in addition, if someone who is of color has an issue with it, the question will be asked, why are you being so sensitive? about it and in fact hey aren't i doing you a favor i'm getting your culture out there more people will be coming to my restaurant and trying this food and so they'll know more about you i've heard that one too <laughs> instead of dealing with this you were doing shit right in the first place. <laughs> this isn't something we would be needing to deal with. Do you have a person of color in that kitchen cooking that food? Are you sourcing your ingredients from providers who are people of color? Have you asked people of color in the community about what offerings to extend through that restaurant? You know, what what are you doing to make it real? Because otherwise it's about green. 
I don't have any objections to green. I do have objections to how you get your green. Does that make sense? Okay. Mm -hmm. So the framework for all of this is going to be around white privilege and how it impacts things and why that lens is so incredibly flawed and what we might offer as whites who are trying to get it and people of color who know better, what we might offer to help shift how that lens works. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. What do you think? <laughs> Sounds great. You had an expression on your face, so I wasn't sure. What? <laughs> Okay. For now, yeah. Okay. <laughs> For now. We all are. <laughs> For now. Yeah. Um, so uh, going forward, this is something that we need to think about and talk about and talk about honestly. And for those of you who are white, who are sitting at this table and who may be on Zoom, uh, silence is not an option. It's not an option. Not because you don't have anything to say, not because you think it's wrong to speak when people of color are at the table, not because you feel guilty if you might be dominating something when people of color should be. It's not acceptable. Silence is not an option. Uh, you are participants in the conversation because you've been participants in what has made all of this real uh, for the world. So. Uh, everybody speaks up. Just don't take over my facilitation. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so that's fine. I can't read it. Yeah, it's fine. I'll, keep, I'll go okay. back with it if, if there's questions. Okay. Um, so are we all in the, on the same page? Yeah. yeah. Great. Time to share. Uh, Two, yeah, yeah, enough. Culinary colonialism. Mm. Awesome. Let me tell you, when I read that, that phrase, something inside of me twisted and then burst open. It was like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Colonialism is so responsible for so much of what is wrong in this country and so many other countries. This notion, this notion that it is okay to just go in and take over. It is not. <laughs> it is not. It has never been okay. And right now is where we begin officially to say no, just no. Now, how we fight it, that's something we have to figure out along the way, right? Because we've been fighting it. It's not that this is new, it's not that this commitment is new. I say official more for me than the whole thing, but there needs to be an official declaration that we're done and we're pursuing something else now. So that's my official declaration. We're done. Colonialism is responsible for poverty, for the raping of continents, for the degradation of what was our beautiful, beautiful earth. And it is still beautiful, but it is running on low. <laughs> And too much of that came through white privilege and this notion of colonialism. So let's talk about colonialism and food, including the farming aspect of it, not just once the food is in the store or on the table. Hi. Hi. Why don't you start that off? 
Um, Y'all should know I don't have problem putting people on the spot. I like that. Um, well, I, I guess on the uh, farm, and there's a lot of places to start. One, one piece for me is um, just the, the challenge we've had of really rec reckoning with the idea of first identifying that we're farming on stolen land, and then we have that piece to it, and then what that actually means in terms of action and change. And initially, that's been putting some energy into building relationship with indigenous people and, and uh, learning and sharing and acknowledging and in the work I do teaching farmers acknowledging that, that uh, every event the land we're on is uh, presenting that I think is important um, but it's ultimately it's ultimately something that sort of uh, feels like a good first step but it isn't changing anything as you, as you said before it's sort of putting something out there. And um, and I think that the when I was uh, growing up and getting into learning about the ways that uh, humans have affected the land on this continent, it was always framed to me in this sort of ecological framework. And it was sort of, well, European colonizer settlers came in and they cleared the land, and put the plow into the land and did all these things, but it was never framed to me in relationship to what that meant for the people on that land. And how that, you can't separate those two things really at the end of the day. So right. if I'm teaching a class about forestry or I'm teaching a class about making maple syrup, what's happened is we've separated those narratives. And, and I've been a you know, part of that. Uh, I worked at the Nature Center up here and we did a maple fest and we had like you know, these stations that were, were supposed to be historical and talking about the history of maple syrup, but it, it really uh, didn't put it in the context of colonialism. Actually, just recently I came across an article that's pretty amazing by a Canadian researcher about indigenous maple sugaring and its relationship to, to colonization. And I'm happy to share with anyone who's interested in that Please do. Thing, but it's, it's, yeah. like, it's like each, what I'm realizing as a farmer is each crop that we have relationships to has that as part of it. And so it's like really trying to follow the thread of each of those things. So we're growing, we also grow mushrooms on our farm. And, and you know, uh, mushrooms have a lineage back into parts of Asia that, uh, that I don't fully understand or acknowledge. And, and so these are all like really important things to, I think, uh, thread. And I, I guess one of the things I've been thinking about are the ways that, that we can uncover and tell those stories as we're, we're sharing the, the foods and crops that we grow. It's not only like important to do, but it's actually really interesting and, and sparks my curiosity. Okay. And it fosters respect. Yeah. I mean, the, <clears throat> just hearing you saying that mm -hmm. feels good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Jay? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think to have a conversation about culinary colonialism, we have to uh, think about what colonialism means and meant um, in terms of at least three, let's say four uh, dynamics. One is the territorial domination of uh, a uh, landscape <clears throat> which often includes a displacement of indigenous cultures, the expropriation of resources from that territory, um, and the application of violence to enable all of that. And <clears throat> also, as with the first point, the, as part of the dominance, uh, exercise and dominance, the reduction of the humanity of those who are being displaced to um, stereotypic, subordinate stereotypic stereotypes, you know, like mm -hmm. the, the, the association of foods. We're talking about foods being um, stereotypically identified with uh, subjugated culture. Um, so that's colonialism. The culinary aspect of that entails all of it because obviously 
the, the control of the landscape to grow the food, right? The displacement of the indigenous cultures. Um, <clears throat> as Steve just said, um, in his study about the settler history, the displacement of the, of the people and their uh, culture was never discussed. And it's hard to discuss. <clears throat> um, so the food that's raised, um, how it was prepared and utilized, um, the whole production and distribution of food that is altered through colonialism um, has to be thought about, right? And also that contributes to things like diet. Um, so, you know, the particular types of food that- It works. How they were prepared and so on and so forth. <clears throat> um, how uh, in food production, we know, for example, that in many indigenous places that were colonized, um, the practice now being introduced in what is called permaculture, like food forests, were a part of indigenous cultures, uh, way of producing food. And uh, that too is part of culinary colonialism. So, and it's interesting that now that we are facing the consequences of um, the effects of the colonial expropriation of resources from, this, from the land, including the fertility of the soil, um, we're going back to those displaced cultural traditions of food production as part of this modern, modernized version of that culture, largely dominated by um, Euro-American Jews. So um, to me, that's all part of the opinion of the Corrected for that is I mean, you really have to think that's a huge piece. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. So I have to say that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> it's just a small piece of that, but what I was thinking about with the culinary colonialism is just in my own position of privilege and living in such a privileged community, having access and the choice to purchase and eat organic foods and artisanal foods that have been produced by people who have chosen that as a profession and are dedicating their life and their knowledge to it is a really beautiful thing. But that the default alternative to that is our uh, being able to take for granted that there's cheap food that is being produced by people who probably aren't making the choice to work in fields that are not safe or not um, environmentally appropriate to produce, you know, mass amounts of grain and vegetables that are then being served to a lot of people who don't have the choice to do something different. And just thinking about, um, yeah, those, those levels of production and also the choices to make for consumers, just how those reflect those same patterns. Patrice, do you want to do a breakout? Do you want me to send the Zoom folks into breakout for this question, or do you want to keep going around and having going around. okay? Just make we're sure. gonna. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't. I forgot to mention this when I was speaking before, uh, or maybe I did. We're going to break out into discussion groups and build relationships uh, in December. So I'm really hoping uh, that everyone who has zoomed in, I like that. Everyone who has tuned in uh, will be rejoining us uh, next month because uh, I think the discussion groups uh, are going to be fantastic. So, okay, so keep going. You want me to keep going? Yep. Okay. Yeah, what? Well, I have something to add. Yeah, great. So, I was think, kind of thinking about what Jay was saying about the subordinate stereotyping and so i was thinking you know if you're a white chef you can go and study in any country or go to any place and be an expert and open a restaurant and make money off of any culture's food um but in the example of rosie perez and in her interview or people constantly asking her about if she still eats rice and beans it's like 
some other people, I'm assuming white people that are asking her this, are trying to take away her success. And because of the way she looks, always they see her as a successful chef and they have to bring it back to that stereotype. And yet a white chef can be successful in any, you know, in any type of food and that that's seen as being a, a better chef is to be an expert in different cultures. Yeah. 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 Laura, did you have anything you wanted to add to this? So, um, I guess in response to what we can do to help ourselves in recognizing and acting against cultural, uh, well, cultural colonialism, but uh, culinary colonialism, I would say that um, one of the one of the biggest things that we have to do is acknowledgement. Um, so, and so like, oh, is that really a Indian dish that you're cooking or are you just using Indian flavors? Like, that's fine, mm -hmm. but it's like, is but acknowledge. it like, oh, I'm, this is Indian food and this is this and this is that. And, mm -hmm. You know, is it really, or is it just the flavors or is it just your iteration of it or is it something else? Are you using quinoa and some rice? Because that makes it different. And um, that acknowledgement of, of like, this isn't mine. I, I appreciate it and, and, and I enjoy the food and I like, working on this and I and I want to eat it so I made it but um that that sort of acknowledgement I've been I've been looking up um certain traditional Dominican recipes for Thanksgiving that I like want to like make something to contribute during the dinner and there's like certain recipes that you'll find online that like are like oh this is that thing and it's not you know, and it, the, the, the person who created the recipe, I, I, I can't see a picture of them, but the, you know, it's this, the name is in a Spanish name. And I'm like, okay, this is not that dish. And so that's a problem. I mean, that's literally misinformation. So that's just like, no, like, do not do that. Um, but that's an aspect of that. Like, and, and, I, and Patrice, I want to go, like, you just, everything you say, pretty much is amazing <laughs> and it's right on and, Thank and, you. And, and and you do it in a way where like because right now i'm gonna i'm gonna go back again to your why questions and the fact that that was perfect because that they're to the core of all these things is that why like why would you do that with the recipe why is that necessary there are other places online that actually provide the recipe why would you do that you know and and why do you feel like you can do that and 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 that core, and, and that, that's what gets me because in my brain, I just don't get it because I don't do that and I'm real and I don't, I'm not gonna be fake about something. And so I, I just don't get it sometimes, but it's, it, but I call them out because that's what has to be done. So accountability, so acknowledgement, how do we, steps, acknowledgement, accountability, holding people accountable calling things out and this stretches out to everything that's going on not just culinary colonialism mm -hmm. and cultural appropriation everything because we are we're not going to move past this point like you we can all be shy about this but we're not going to go anywhere if we continue to do that so if we want to make things go faster let's just be real about things and it may hurt and it may feel weird and it may feel awkward, but we have to do it. And everyone has to do it because even people of color, even there, there is racism within the Dominican Republic. There is racism within Haiti. There is racism within Africa. So everyone has work to do, you know? The, the issue of colorism is a very real thing and everyone has that work to do. So for the white people that feel, oh, cornered and like, you know, like it's not just about you. Everyone has the work to do, so get over yourself. And, and let's all do the work and let's be real. And, and, and so please remember, when you feel like you're not being real, you'll feel that inside of you. You feel that little voice. And let that little voice take over and make you feel like an asshole. Pretty much, that's all you have to do. Let that little voice make you feel like an asshole and make you feel fake and it'll keep doing that and just listen to it and that's it. That's all you have to do. Because it's there. It's there. <laughs> <laughs>
that little voice is there. Yeah. I tend to run that away from really right like a natural. <laughs> 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 Although I do call myself on being a jackass sometimes because, well, it it's just rude. <laughs> I can add some thought. I had, um, yeah, Laura was, was around acknowledgement, um, and then you laid out specific <laughs> acknowledgement accountability. Um, calling it out. I think I think about a lot. Francois maybe a year ago started our all of our workshops and public events acknowledging that we're on stolen land and whose land you know it was stolen from. And then I and I think about that question a lot. Like acknowledgement's not enough. And until Groundswell, which is the direction that you know we try to move in with our incubator farm, but like until we're actually talking about giving land back to those people. Um, you know, in some way, supporting supporting issues that are in food and farming that are still just discriminatory and racist and shift that, then acknowledgement's great, but it kind of just makes me feel good. And like, it, it brings it into the room. And I think it's important to know the history of, of the, the home that we're so lucky to live on, but it's, it's only one of like many other steps, just like, like Laura listed a few of them, so. So, I, I have, unless you really have a lot to share. Um, I mean, the, the thing is, like, it's important to kind of realize, like, in a, in a cultural colonial situation that we all exist in, that um, foundationally it's built on, and really, you, you would think that everything in office would be a felony and the voting rights would be taken away because it was built on stealing and lying. And really, almost everything is built on stealing and lying. I mean, racism um, kind of makes that happen because it's kind of like, you don't own anything. I own everything about you. Like, I own your name, your land, what you create. I create new things from it and I appropriate it and then it becomes mine. And, you know, so it's kind of like, there's a spiritual aspect to it. And I definitely think that acknowledgement is definitely important. But, you know, people can also feel like when you're just token acknowledging things and when you really actually have done work and you can feel the feeling that people kind of, appreciate the depth of thousands of years of knowledge that you now have are using and it's helping you to survive like there's and when jay and i and natalie were at the sean sean's uh what's his last name sean sherman lakota guy a chef um sous chef his book is called sous chef um but the gentleman that has the uh company yeah he's got yeah, a company right. that is promoting indigenous the growing of indigenous yeah animals. they're fantastic, they're uh, fantastic. The, the national cooperative conference two years ago they were there and provided a meal mm -hmm. that was entirely indigenous and sourced only from the local foods in that area where the conference yeah. He's was. amazing. That guy's amazing. It he's was amazing. Model. He's actually a model for like every this organization. Yeah. Yeah. What I was gonna say is like he it's not, you know, like I, I'm gonna get to this kind of like bottom question, the provocative question of like, you know, like what kind of world we want to live in where it's like, you know, you're wearing my colors or whatever, whatever. Um, he made a point and one of the things he said was the way someone asked about getting some of the corn, the seeds to start. It was like, it was like that, you know, some people he ignored and the people who asked in the right way, like he was ready to share it. People are, want, we all want to share. With yes. Them. We all want a world where we feel valued by each other and respected by each other and seen by each other. That's what we all want, you know what I mean? And so, and then, and then you're working up against the, little voice inside that people don't want to hear because their whole worldview is built on so many lies and so much stealing. I mean, so much stealing. I mean, why don't, you know, the Cherokee Jeeps or whatever, it's like, do the Cherokee people get a cut of that every time you use that word? I mean, like, there's just so many, so many ways that things are reapportioned and reality is 
we made to, to make a different reality with not sharing happening and stealing is, is not even mentioned. And so all these things that you know, people really need to come to grips with. So I'm just trying to say that people will not easily want to listen to that small still voice, which is why we're in this situation. And would that it could be so easy that people would want to embrace thinking, oh, what an asshole I just was, or like, oh, I, I mean, I'm trying to make that person feel worse because I, I'm gonna feel it worse, so if I don't make them feel it, you know, whatever. It's like people are, aren't like that, it takes a lot of work, and I think, yeah, doesn't take okay. that much. <laughs> well, it takes, it, it does take a lot of work, but I, it, it's a, I like to tell people who, who get into, into this uh, frame of reference, it's, it's a simple concept. It's a simple concept and it's easy to understand and even commit yourself to. But the doing has all kinds of levels of complexity uh, because we're human and human beings psychologically run away from pain. They run away from awkwardness. They run away from hurt. Um, we're, we're designed to go towards joy uh, and things that make us feel good about ourselves and others. And we have so follow that stream that we've done it to the point where we are self-destructive. I mean, that's the point of the high, right? Uh, to hide you from reality, uh, to take over. Uh, so we, we have misaligned uh, our need for the joy. Uh, joy is wonderful, uh, but we're not supposed to be experiencing 100% of the time, day and night, there are struggles as well, right? And the struggles are what help us grow and evolve and become uh, better designed human beings. Uh, but we don't want to do that because uh, we want what's easy. Uh, I always hated that Burger King thing. Is it Burger King? Um, uh, you can have it your way sort of a thing. I'm like, what foolishness is that? First of all, my mama didn't ever cook anything just for me. <laughs> you ate what was provided, period. You can have it your way, it didn't exist. <laughs> I know it does more today, but then that in itself is part of the problem in this culinary uh, discussion. Um, people thinking they can have things the way they want them, when they want them, how they want them, and, and that's just not true. We are. Um, I refer, refer to as a wonderfully, deliciously human. Um, and we are. We just keep serving up side dishes of assholeness. <laughs> can, can I add you know, something? Sure. And then I'm gonna we're gonna start breaking it down, uh, closing it out. So yeah, I, I think the thing to, to bear in mind is um because I, I want to rip off of what Mars said. Um, I don't, you know, as a human being, I don't see any problem with people exchanging different cultural information and values and culinary, you know, recipes and things like that. Um, it becomes colonialism because of the issue of power. The framework for looking at this, as far as I'm concerned, are the power relations between those who appropriate um, or those who assert dominance and those who are dominated. And for me, the current framework is white supremacy. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, am I guilty of cultural appropriation when I use chopsticks? I love to eat with chopsticks. I, I'm studying Chinese cuisine, right? Um, but I'm not going to take the chopsticks and claim them as either an African invention, my invention, or take their cuisine and, um, and yeah, exactly, <laughs> or rename it, yeah, according. Yeah. 
And that has to do again with a power relationship. So I just wanted to enunciate that because I think sometimes <clears throat> that framework, um, I think everybody in this room is aware of it, but that sometimes is part of the privilege in my view of whites in ignoring the factors that are part of culinary colonialism. Um, but, I, but I'm for everybody sharing everybody's food. I think somebody mentioned earlier <clears throat> online that food is what brings us together. And well, it should, right? It's just a question of um, who claims ownership and how that's done, the, the framework of right. power. Right. So uh, we're going to start um, narrowing this down and closing out. And I want to, uh, because I am myself Socratic in nature, I'm going to throw some uh, ideas and questions out there for uh, further consideration um, along these lines. But I also want to remind a few of the things that struck me when people were speaking. Um, uh, Laura, in terms of acknowledgement and accountability, um, and from me, culture and power shifts, uh, from Jay, the notion of territorial domination, uh, ex expropriation of resources and application of violence in order to get uh, what uh, white privilege has uh, accorded uh, white people. Um, and when you were talking about indigenous lands and um, at some point there should be a notion of uh, giving back. Um, and what occurred to me was giving back, but rather than making that an end in and of itself to just give back the land, uh, but give it back and do what should have been done in the first place if you want it lease it lease it the land is someone else's and should remain theirs if you want to use it instead of being colonial about it <laughs> and destroying entire peoples enter into a business relationship which is what whites have expected uh, to do with other whites, except when they do it with people of color, uh, they usually end up being dishonest. Uh, they cheat, they steal, they give lower prices, they, you know, find ways to renege on deals and, and all of that. Uh, give it back. And then if you want to do it, if you still want to use the land, you find a way to do it, uh, with justice and integrity. Um, and then uh, some questions or some entreaties to dig deeper so that we can really have this discussion. Um, as white farmers and producers and artisans, how can you assist in bringing more people of color into farming? Uh, what part of that work will you take on uh, as an individual and in the groups and the organizations you work through? Because the reason there are so few is because whites lacked integrity uh, and drove them off. There have been, uh, and right now I'm going to talk about African American, this is what I know best. Um, there have been successful. African American uh, farmers and producers and uh, industrialists and you know communities forever in the United States, uh, going back to slavery on up to today, and at almost every juncture, uh, when white folks cottoned on to that success, they sought to destroy it, to utterly and completely destroy it as if, how dare you? And as I said to one of my aunties once, 
who was fond of saying, how dare you? I dare. And I don't think it's too much to say that black folks tend to dare. <laughs> That's what survival is. That's what thriving is. Uh, it's about daring uh, to go after what you want, pursuing it with a passion and sweat and sometimes blood and keeping at it and insisting on making it yours. The difference between how uh, those communities, uh, black communities did that and how the white communities did it is that we used our own sweat and our own blood and our own work to achieve that success. And whites, though they did that sometimes, often simply stooped to theft and destruction to have what they wanted. That has to stop and that has to be discussed. Um, there is so much of the world right now that is in white hands that shouldn't be based on theft and destruction of other people's, right? So what are we going to do about that? How is that conversation going to be held? What are some of the uh, solutions we want to talk about, possible solutions? Um, uh, do that. Farming, production, and cooking. Uh, who's doing what, how, why, when, where, <laughs> all of those. Um, how are we going to think our way through these issues? And remember that we're really, we're talking about farming and food and justice. So even if we narrow it to that, <laughs> instead of talking about the entirety of what is unjust. Farming, food, and justice. Start asking yourself real questions. Dig deep. Be willing to expose yourself. Be vulnerable, be uncomfortable. Embrace your assholeness. <laughs> Know that that's there, that it happens. And know that if you're human, I can guarantee you, you have not led an asshole free existence. There is somewhere in your life where you did something that you shouldn't have. All the time. Grab a hold. We all do. Embrace it, because on so many levels, Laura is absolutely right. It is a simple thing made complex because of our layers of humanity, yes. That doesn't mean you can't break down those layers and get to know yourself much. It's, of course, it's a commitment. It is all a commitment. The point is, if we don't make the commitment, here we stay. Now, if anyone in this group and online is content with where we are, fine. But you probably shouldn't be having conversations with me. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> because there are people who think I hurt people's feelings. Mm -hmm. I am not here to hurt your feelings. I'm here to get you to speak truth to power. We have work to do. Here we are doing the work. And in order to do it, you have to be willing to ask the deeper questions about you, about the organizations you're a part of, about the culture you serve. And yes, you do serve your culture. If you are white, you serve privilege because privilege is what allows you to be comfortable in your skin. That does not absent people of color from similar responsibilities. So we too have to ask ourselves the hard, difficult, deep questions. And we are in this together, make no mistake. We are in this together. Uh, 
It is. It's a big question about presenter skirt training. Not yeah. Related to today, so I was looking at the time. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to go long. Go long. Yeah. yeah. Um, so this is where we are. This is where we're going to be going for next month. Um, I'm going to be doing more and more of this work. In fact, I'm working on some online uh, workshops, but um, my time's at a premium uh, <laughs> these days. Uh, I think I may have to just start carving out time mm -hmm. uh, to work on it. Um, I'm excited about this work. I think we are uh, capable of doing some incredible things here. But I want to know, even though this is you know through next month, um, I want to know, I want to hear, I want to read that you are committed to this work. So if you're online, if you're zooming in, if you're committed to this work, I want to see a series of yeses from you coming in. Uh, if you're not, that's fine. But if you are, I want to see you say yes. And if you're around the table and you're committed to this work, which means that even after December, when I want to have a conversation with somebody, I have a rap session, I'm old enough for that too. <laughs> um, I want to know that there are people that I can reach out to and have that conversation who are interested in having that conversation and making that larger and larger and larger. Yes. 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 <laughs> Thank you. And this brings us to within two minutes of closing. And so I'm going to say I am absolutely delighted uh, to be able to facilitate uh, discussions like this and create these questions and have us dig deep and do the work uh, because I too am committed. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, folks. Um, I'll be sending emails to everyone um, who's here in person and on Zoom with a really short, I promise it's short, um, evaluation, <laughs> feedback um, type thing. Um, but again, it really does help us keep these free and make them relevant to the work we're all really trying to do. Um, and we'll share some resources that were brought up today. Um, I'll also share those in the email you'll receive with the evaluation. Yeah, including the including Steve's Maple, the thing Steve Maple. And what else you said? Oh, December's date is December twelfth. Um, and so if I guess if you're online, you would have registered. If you're in here in person and didn't register, that's why we didn't send you the articles or you didn't know about them because we only sent them to folks who registered. So apologize for that. That just helps us track our numbers, which helps us get funding. So it's sort of wrapped up, but we will post those articles on the Farming for Justice web page um, on our website as well. If you so, in case you lose them or want to reference them. Thanks so much. And this was recorded, so we'll um, share it to our blog, and you can share it with others if you'd like. Encourage folks to to come join you next time on December twelfth and sit there with you and do this work together. Thanks. Have a great day. Mwah. <laughs>